This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Chapter 2 looks at corporate governance, and that's a system by which companies are directed and controlled. <clears throat> now, historically, uh, the, the only way really this, this corporate governance uh, was, I suppose, enforced uh, was that every year you have an annual general meeting that's where all of the shareholders are entitled to uh, attend the meeting and to vote on resolutions <coughs> and to perhaps appoint auditors or appoint directors at the agm uh, the financial statements would be presented and they would have been audited once a year uh, so once a year really the members of the uh, uh, company would go to a meeting and get a set of financial statements. And that worked for, I suppose, you know, reasonably, there's a great kind of devolution of power. You had the, the, the shareholders who owned the company. You had the directors who would run the company on a day-to-day -day basis. And the directors were supposed to be running the, the company on uh, the basis of board meetings where they'd all sit around and make kind of group decisions. Uh, the problem was that maybe the board meetings weren't held very often. Uh, quite often the board uh, meetings were almost a formality that most of the decision making had been made before the board meetings. And you would have the chief executive officer who go to one director uh, and kind of talk to that director and get that director on side. Then go to another director separately, separate chat and persuasion, get that director on side. Uh, so that when it came to the, the, the board meeting, almost everything had been decided already. Very little kind of collective responsibility uh, was was uh, very often there. Particularly if you had what, what is called a very dominant chief executive who would steamroller over uh, perhaps what the, the real board would be capable of doing if they, they met as a whole. Now, uh, this uh, worked, I suppose, reasonably for uh, some, some, some time, and this is a, a kind of a, an explanation or a diagram of how it worked here. Uh, you have the uh, shareholders here. Oops. Uh, you have the shareholders here who own a company, and the company should be run for their benefit. Their shareholders appointed directors, but the directors manage the company on a day-to-day -day basis. And you have a particular, uh, a potential kind of conflict here that the directors who are there on a day-to-day -day basis begin running the company more for their own benefit uh, than for the shareholders. The directors uh, here are the agents. The shareholders here are what are called the principals. The company should be run for the principals, run for the shareholders, uh, but uh, there's a well-known what's called an agency problem in that the, the agents or directors may begin, for example, giving themselves very large pay rises, very lavish company cars, first-class air travel, and so on, uh, at to, really to the detriment of the profits that, that would be made for the shareholders. Once a year, the directors would prepare the financial statements, and the auditors would uh, audit those financial statements. The auditors were and are indeed appointed uh, by the uh, shareholders. So the, the financial statements are prepared. They are checked, if you like, here by the auditor. Uh, and then they would be presented to the shareholders at or shortly before the, the AGM. And that was the extent of it. The trouble is, if you're only having one AGM and one set of financial statements, you could have 12, 15 months between those, which gives the directors a huge amount of uh, flexibility or leeway uh, to be getting on with stuff without perhaps really very much supervision or very much knowledge, actually, from the shareholders. And it took several very, very large corporate scandals and failures uh, before this rudimentary method of corporate governance was looked at again. 
So uh, we had Enron, a huge energy company which failed in, in America, WorldCom, a big communications company. Uh, about 2008, we had Lehman Brothers, a very big bank in America, failed. Uh, and a lot of what was going on in these, these companies was that certainly in Enron and WorldCom, you had a very dominant chief executive who had almost absolute power, uh, who would make decisions that were perhaps good for the directors or good for the chief executive, but put the shareholders at huge risk. Uh, and nobody really knew that these companies were in any kind of danger until suddenly there was a collapse. And this made people think, how come these huge companies can collapse so quickly? Maybe there's something inadequate in these annual audits which are performed. Maybe there's too much space between them, too much flexibility. So companies uh, have been forced by the countries in which they're trading to bring in uh, additional systems of corporate governance. First thing to look at is the OECD, that's the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, who uh, suggested some overarching principles of corporate governance. Uh, and different countries were then allowed to implement these principles in their own ways. And it's quite a different way of implementation between the uh, approach taken, say, in America. There's something there called the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, uh, which is a very kind of procedural act. People have to sign off lots and lots of documentation that certain things have been done, compared to, say, what's been adopted in most of Europe, uh, which is very much uh, you want people to follow the spirit of the law rather than to sign off kind of principles-based rather than very procedurals-based. But anyway, they're all aiming at the same things, uh, although they may do it in through different approaches. So the sort of things that the OECD would like to see in a kind of perfect system of corporate governance, they want uh, corporate governance which promotes a transparent and efficient markets and be consistent with the rule of law. So transparent and efficient markets, an efficient market is where the share price of a listed company uh, represents the true value of that company or that share. And for that to happen, it has to be, it has to be a transparent system. Uh, you mustn't be keeping information secret. So if there was a takeover bid, you're really supposed to announce it even when the takeover bid is, is just been um, mounted, if you like, because if you kept the, the chance of a takeover secret, the shares would probably be below maybe what their true value was. And that is a, an inefficient market. This is unfair to certain shareholders. You have to recognize the rights of shareholders and their key ownership functions. You have to make sure that uh, shareholders are encouraged to attend AGMs. You must uh, keep uh, in, in, in touch with them. You must make efforts to keep in touch with your shareholders and to consult them where necessary. There has to be fair and equitable treatment of shareholders, particularly those uh, who are minority shareholders uh, and who are perhaps uh, based abroad. If you take a, think of a company quoted on the London Stock Exchange, some of those shares, large proportions, can be owned by pension funds, very large investors, also based in London. And there was a kind of a, a bit of a habit, I'm not sure it's entirely died out yet, but that the finance director of the company would take out to lunch uh, one of the pension investment managers, uh, maybe owning 10-20% of this listed company, and would explain to this very privileged pension manager uh, what the company was doing uh, and why maybe you should hang on to those shares because we're having some great, great ideas for improving profits, whereas the small shareholders, not attending that lunch of course, would, would not get that information and would not know whether to buy or sell shares. Uh, that was, you know, the kind of decisions that the, the major shareholder was being given given access to. Similarly, foreign shareholders 
Uh, there's, uh, if you're in the, the, the city of London, the, the information news follows. It's quite a closed shop in many ways. Information flows very, very quickly between different institutions. If you were based in, let's say, Sydney and Australia, uh, then, then of course, you're, you're outside the loop to a little bit. And, and you could be being treated unfairly there simply because you will hear the news, but maybe not until a day later. Uh, and, and again, you will be putting it at, at a disadvantage. Recognize the, uh, the rights of stakeholders, not just shareholders, but stakeholders. Stakeholders could imp uh, be uh, the uh, employees, could be stakeholders. Uh, customers as stakeholders, suppliers as stakeholders, the government as a stakeholder, anyone who is affected by the company as a stakeholder. And you may have to recognize their rights as well. Although there are considerable differences between national legislation about how much maybe you should consult your employees if you're thinking of closing down a factory. There should be timely and accurate disclosure of all material matters. For example, the takeover. Uh, or if you were a pharmaceutical company and one of your drugs was suddenly uh, suspected of very serious side effects, you had to withdraw it from the market, you should announce it. It's not being fair. You're not, as a director, not being fair to your shareholders if you keep this important information about their company, if you keep it secret. And also lays out, uh, finally here, responsibilities of the board. A great, a lot of responsibilities are kind of set out here. That the board is responsible for an ethical approach of the company. That the board is, uh, being at the top of the company's kind of hierarchy, the board is uh, uh, responsible for determining the company's strategy. You know, where is the company going to be in five years? What's it going to be doing? What sort of products is it going to be making? Because the, the shareholders want long-term success. And we don't want the board just looking at one or two years ahead, looking maybe for their own bonuses. They should be looking at the long-term success of the company. And the, the board has to meet sufficiently office. Uh, uh, often the, the, the board members have to give sufficient care and time, uh, sufficient diligence really, to look after the management of the company properly. Now, within the UK, uh, the uh, UK Corporate Governance Code is the way in which the OECD principles have been established. And uh, for your exams, you are permitted to use the UK Corporate Governance Code approach when explaining uh, what may be desirable in corporate governance, or perhaps you're given a little scenario where something's gone wrong with the corporate governance, you can rely on or talk about this UK corporate governance code. And it says we want uh, proper leadership. The leadership has to be effective. There has to be accountability. We have to look at the remuneration of the directors, and we have to look at the relations with shareholders. In the UK, uh, the UK Corporate Governance Code is not law. It has got no statutory backing. However, any company which is listed on the stock exchange has to comply with the UK Corporate Governance Code or explain why not. So comply or explain. Uh, and if it wasn't complying with the UK Corporate Governance Code and didn't uh, explain properly why it was departing from the rules which were laid down, then as a last resort, the stock exchange could suspend the shares so they could be no longer traded. So it's, uh, it's not law, but it's a very effective sanction that large companies uh, can have imposed on them by the stock exchange. Okay, let's uh, look at what it says about leadership. Uh, we have here the idea that every company should be headed by an effective board, which is, as we said in strategy, is responsible for the long-term success of the company. Secondly, very importantly, there should be a division between running the board uh, and uh, running the company's business. Now, the people who, or the person who runs the board is a chairman, 
the person who runs the business is a chief executive officer and they should be separate people. One of the problems found with uh, WorldCom and Enron was you had one very powerful person at the top that no one would object to, no one would say no to. Now what we're doing is we're splitting the power at the top between the chairman and the chief executive officer so to some extent they, they will keep an eye on each other. You're diluting one person's power, you're, you're sharing it. The chairman is responsible for the leadership of the board. The chief executive officer responsible for the, the, the executive decisions, the running of the company. There should be non-executive directors. Non-executive directors are full directors. They uh, will sit in board mini uh, meetings. They will have votes in board minutes, but they have no what's called executive or day-to-day -day management responsibilities. The idea is that these people should be fairly independent. In particular, their remuneration shouldn't depend on the profits of the company, so they shouldn't be encouraged to make risky decisions in the hope that they will get a big bonus, for example. So these people will be there to warn and to advise, uh, sitting in on the board, able to perhaps vote down what the executive board members want. And these people have to be of sufficient quality. So if you're dealing with a company like, say, BP, uh, then you want people who have got a, a, a really good history in sitting on the boards of international listed companies. Some of them may be associated with the energy business, but sometimes you want people from another business, maybe slightly associated, uh, to give a bit of perspective on what's happening within the company. And these people can often be very, very powerful at raising ethical objections. They see very often the bigger picture, perhaps, of what the company is trying to do. How many non-executive directors? Well, the, the word that's usually used is a balance, which is roughly 50-50. Okay? It's not a, an executive board of eight and two non-executive directors, because those two non-executive directors could almost be ignored. So you want about half your board at least to be non-executive directors, so they're real power in the board meeting. You have to have uh, what's called a rigorous transparent procedure for the appointment of new directors. The way to some extent it used to be done is the way a, <coughs> a, a vacancy in the board would be filled was maybe the chief executive officer says, I know someone. I have a friend, or I know someone who, who I play golf with. They would be just perfect uh, to be the executive to, uh, the executive director in this, this company. And then, of course, maybe the, the favour is kind of repaid. And you've got a very kind of close, almost incestuous, maybe appointment process. What you want, the appointment of a director, is something which is as rigorous as appointing, say, an accountant. You want to advertise the post. You want to bring people in for, for, for interviews. Uh, you want to compare their skills against the skills you need. And you want to uh, appoint the best person for the job, not, not the one that one of the other directors happens to know. This should be in the hands of what's called a nomination committee. And the nomination committee is comprised of non-executive directors. So it is an independent committee for appointing or suggesting nominating new appointments to the board to be voted on then at the AGM. Directors have to be able to allocate sufficient time. You have to give them a bit of training when they join. Why do you think somebody can come floating in at a very high level in the company and immediately be able to be effective? Train them. There should be some induction. Keep them up to date. Uh, because you, you can't assume that without almost continuing professional uh, education they're going to keep the, the right skills. They have to be applied, they have to be uh, supplied with the, the right information in, in, a, in, a, in a timely manner uh, so that they can make their uh, board decisions. They should, very importantly, evaluate their own performance. Surely it was a bit odd that in many companies, everybody uh, had an annual appraisal interview, uh, 
uh, were told what they were good at, what they were bad at, what their objectives were last year. But the people at the top, the people who could maybe have most influence on the success of the company, were never reviewed. So you should review the performance of the executive directors. Who do you think will do that? Well, I think it will be the non-executive directors. They will bring in perhaps a sales director and say, well, you promised a 20% growth in revenue. It's only 12%. What happened? Is it you or is it the economy? Why why didn't your, your uh, forecast sales come to pass? And all directors uh, should be submit themselves to re-election at uh, regular intervals. You don't want people getting in there as a kind of job for life. You want to keep them on their toes. Uh, accountability uh, here. The board should present a balanced and understandable uh, assessment of the company's position. This is to do to some extent with financial statements, but also in financial statements you have uh, the director's report, you have the chairman's statement, uh, and they, they have to uh, present that in a balanced and understandable way. The board is responsible for looking at the significant risks. Uh, so we're not just pursuing profit uh, irrespective of what the risk might be. Profit and risk kind of go hand in hand. Everyone knows that, that it is risky investing in a company, but what we want is to get the right balance between risk and return. Not just risk and return, but what do your shareholders want? Some shareholders want a safe investment. Some shareholders want a more exciting investment. And we have to make sure that the uh, the company in which these people are investing, if you like, uh, tracks the right course between risk and return. And uh, we have to have what's called then an audit committee. Formal and transparent arrangements uh, for uh, maintaining, it says here, appropriate relationship with the company's auditors. The uh, audit committee is again something which is going to be non-executive directors. Audit committee, very important, we'll see in a moment. It gives auditors more power because the auditors are going to be reporting to the audit committee. The auditors might be criticising something in the financial statements. There's no audit committee. The auditors are probably going to be uh, uh, reporting to the finance director, the very person who is responsible for the financial statements. So you have to have an audit committee and you have to keep on the review the need for internal audit. Okay. So internal audit are employees of the company uh, with a special task, if you like, of making sure the internal controls have been designed well and working well. More and more companies have internal audits as an internal audit department as a very important way of enhancing their internal control. But it's not absolutely necessary. They have to keep the need for this under review. Here's the sort of things the audit committee uh, does. Here it liaises with the external uh, auditors. Uh, it it uh, will maybe set the scope of the internal auditors if they uh, offer a bit of the external auditors. If the external auditors resign or maybe we think they're not doing very well, it'll be the audit committee who maybe says, I think we should change from this firm of auditors to that firm of auditors. They have this link between the directors and the auditors. So the auditors will probably report first to the audit committee maybe about problems in the financial statements or problems about getting information and then the order committee remember these are non-executive directors who to some extent shouldn't really care what the profit is they just want the profit to be reported fairly they their remuneration will not depend on the profit they will not be trying to build up the profit for, for some particular reason and uh, if there were some problems with the uh, financial statements would be called here auditors reservations then it would be the internal auditors who would first of all try to resolve those occasionally the external auditors may be inhibited from getting the information they need maybe maybe the finance director refuses to show them some information and auditors are entitled to 
all the information and explanations they require. And the the, the, the order committee, being non-executive directors, of course, sit on the main board. And if you're sitting on the main board, you can raise at the main board meeting, look, the auditors are not being able to get information because that finance director will not supply it to them. They also liaise with the internal audit uh, here, review what internal audit is doing, and they will sometimes uh, be responsible for, for, they will be responsible for looking at the reports of the internal auditors, and sometimes they might mount special investigations. They might ask for internal audit to look at the suspicion of fraud, or perhaps large losses which were incurred in a particular branch. And uh, they will send out internal audit for a couple of weeks to try to find explanations about that. Back to the Corporate Governance Code remuneration. One of the big uh, abuses of uh, the older style companies <clears throat> was that uh, because they weren't watched very carefully, <clears throat> the directors were able to award themselves very large bonuses. Nothing wrong with large bonuses as such, provided they were earned, provided it wasn't too easy to get the bonus, provided if the that the bonus was only obtained maybe for double profits or, or whatever it was. And there had been cases where directors awarded themselves share options. That's the right to buy a share. And then, and then of course, you can sell it and make a profit. Uh, if you, they were offered, they offered themselves in a way share options where the option price was below the current price. So you could almost immediately buy at the option price and sell at the real market price, having done nothing whatsoever. The third committee here, remember, we've had the order committee, we've had the nomination committee, now we have the remuneration committee in here again. Non-executive directors will be on this. These are the people who are responsible for determining the remuneration of the directors. A large, large proportion of the remuneration of directors uh, should link to how the company is doing. What you want is what's good for the company and its shareholders is good for the directors. You want those linked. High profits, good for the company, good for the shareholders. High share price, good for the members of the company, good for the shareholders, good for the directors, and so on. You want those going hand in hand. It is not the purpose of the remuneration committee uh, to uh, pay the minimum possible money to the worst possible director. You have to get in a way value for money. We need good directors. You have to pay them a reasonable amount to attract them in, uh, but we don't want to be paying them more than we actually need to. Relations with shareholders. Relations with shareholders uh, is to be encouraged. To some extent, uh, shareholders can be their own worst enemies. They're invited to AGMs, but very few shareholders will actually turn up to annual general meetings. The big ones will, the big pension funds and investment trust managers will and so on, but very few small shareholders will turn up to these meetings. It's important that directors uh, keep trying to stay in touch and, uh, and issue information to all shareholders so they're kept up to date with what the company is doing. So we should communicate with investors, encourage their participation, issue newsletters, circulars and so on, so that the members of the company are encouraged to keep a closer eye on their investment and what the company is doing.